accomplished. One God forever praised. Amen. Okay, well, we are looking at the book of Revelation this evening. Um, we are going to look at just a few verses. I wanted to get through more text, but there's just so much going on in these three verses. So we're going to look at Revelation 1, 9 to 11. Uh, if you're able, I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. If you don't have your own copy of scriptures, this won't be on the screen, so I recommend uh, grabbing the Pewback Bible, and it'll be on page 1, 2, 3, 4. Thus reads the word of the Lord. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the witness of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write in a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to the- Theatria and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Thus, this is the word of the Lord. Be to God. You may be seated. You are a part of the kingdom of God. What do you imagine when you think of you, yourself, being into the kingdom of God? What image does that provoke? You in the kingdom of God, whatever that looks like. Whatever that might look like to you, it might look different from person to person. You might be inside some uh, place with golden streets and pearly gates or in a place that looks like our world except no wars or rumors of wars, a place that looks a lot like the church. We all have different perceptions of what it might look like. You might be clothed in royal regalia and royal robes, uh, maybe at a, a table feasting. You have different pictures. We all have different pictures of what it might look like to be in the kingdom of God. Probably none of us in this room just pictured sitting on some island in the middle of the sea, the ocean, in a cave, huddled over a piece of parchment, scratching out visions that we saw in the night. Obviously, I'm describing to you John, who wrote the book of Revelation. He's on Patmos. He's probably in some cave somewhere, scratching out his revelation he received. However, John describes himself as being part of the kingdom of God. So how's that square? How do we square those things, right? You think of the kingdom of God. I think of the kingdom of God as this glorious thing. And John says in in verse 9, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom. How can he say I'm a fellow partaker in the kingdom when he has such a wildly different view or description or experience of the kingdom of God? How is he a fellow partaker in the kingdom? Is he confused? Surely the kingdom of God has not come yet. Is, Paul, is John anticipating something that hasn't yet occurred? What's going on there? Well, we're going to dig into that this evening. And before we do that, I want to point something out a little, a little grammatical, okay? Uh, John's, the, 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 the order of the Greek words that John is using here. Uh, is such that he, ha- he uses the definite article, which is the word the, right? He uses the word the, and then a few words, three words. And so in Greek, when you use one definite article, one the, and then multiple words, whether it's two or three or four or five, the word the encompasses all of them, meaning that all those words are identified together. And that's what he's doing here, right? He says the, that's the one definite article, the, tribulation and kingdom and perseverance. That Greek structure means that all three words are identified, right? A a Greek lexicon says the use of one article, one word the, before a number of nouns indicates that they are conceived as forming a certain unity, if not as identical. That's the grammatical construction John's using here. One the, a bunch of nouns. It means that they are Forming a certain unity, if not identical. So what are the words? Tribulation, kingdom, perseverance. Not three words that we would lump together, right? 
you wouldn't necessarily lump tribulation with kingdom. We think of kingdom as the tribulation is done. Tribulation being suffering, uh, wars, persecution, hard times, death. That's all tribulation. And when we think of kingdom, we think of something else. But the way that John's writing here, unequivocally, inescapably, you could look at, this is one Greek grammar textbook, but you could look at 10, and they'd all say the same thing. When you've got one definite article, all the nouns following it, they're all identified as one. How could John do that? Uh, John does that again in Revelation 3, uh, verse 17. In 3, 17... It says, this is the Lord Jesus speaking in that latter half of the verse. It says, you are wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. Now our translation, it doesn't show the word the. In the Greek, the word the is before the word wretched. Right? So the, the article in the Greek, sometimes you need it, sometimes you don't need it in English. But in Greek, it's there. Just one word, the. It literally, it's you are the wretched and pitiable, poor and blind and naked. All of those words are not describing different people. All of those words are describing one people, the people of Laodicea. It's the same construction, one the and a bunch of nouns, all describing the same people. Same thing in our text here. When when John says, I'm a fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, it's all describing the same thing, using these radically different words. How is this possible? In Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, it says this. Now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he, that's Jesus, answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Look here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is in your midst. That phrase, in your midst, It can be translated within or among, and it occurs over and over again. That's Luke 17, 20. It happens in Matthew 12, 28, Luke 10, 9, 11, 20, 21, 31. The word within or among or near at hand. This is what Jesus says about the kingdom. So John, knowing Christ, having the ministry of Christ, being saved by Christ, having the word of Christ, knowing that Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst or even within you, John, in the midst of his tribulation, says, I'm a partaker of the kingdom. How's that possible? Well, I told you, as we go through Revelation, I'm not doing the whole, this is all millennialism and premillennialism and this millennialism and that millennialism and, you know, pan-trib and pre-trib and, you know, all that stuff. I'm not doing all the fancy words, right? Except for one. I'm doing one fancy word, and that is inaugurated eschatology. I'm going to keep saying that over and over again, so by the time we get to Revelation, you'll remember it, because it's really important. Inaugurated eschatology. What does that mean? Inaugurated eschatology, right? It's like the inauguration, the way to remember it. What's inaugurated? Inauguration of the president, right? What happens when the president's inaugurated? He gets voted in. He's the president, but I forget how long. There's 40 days or something like that in between when the president is inaugurated and when he sits in the Oval Office, right? There's that span of time in in between where the old president can, you know, uh, ram through all the things that he tried to get done that he couldn't do and uh, clear out the Oval Office, and the new president comes in. Inaugurated, okay? Uh, The same idea has been conveyed through the concept of uh, D-Day and V-Day, right? Remember in, the world, in World War II, there was D-Day. There was the day when the Allied forces stormed Normandy, the beaches of Normandy. And on D-Day, after that battle on Normandy, for all intents and purposes, the war was over. Once the, the iron uh, the wall of defense that the axis of evil uh, was punctured and the Allied forces got through on D-Day once they stormed Normandy, once they got on the continent, it was over. It was just a series of little unwinnable battles that had to finish. That was D-Day. But there was all those battles, and then V-Day, Victory Day, happened sometime later. Right? That's inaugurated eschatology. It means Christ is inaugurated. D-Day has been completed. However, 
We're waiting for Christ, as it were, to move into the Oval Office. However, we're waiting for V-Day to finally happen. We're in this in-between period, right? We're not before that. We're not way over here waiting for Christ to get inaugurated, waiting for D-Day. We're not there. That day's already happened. That happened on the cross. Right now, we're just waiting for the end to come. We know what's going to happen. Right now, we see all these wars, these spiritual battles happening, but they're like the skirmishes in Germany. They're wars, they're important, they're battles, but the war, for all intents and purposes, is over. That is how John is able to say, from a cave in Patmos on the island, being exiled, he's able to say, I'm your fellow partaker, not just in tribulation, but also in the kingdom, and they are essentially the same thing. The kingdom's here, John says. And so as we read the book of Revelation, we need to read it through that lens. We need to read it through the lens of John saying, hey, the the end has already been inaugurated. D-Day has already been won. These things are already starting to come to pass. We are living in the time of Revelation, in the time of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation is not just about the very end. The book of Revelation applied to John and the people he was writing to, to the seven churches, to the ancient church, to the medieval church, to the church of the Reformation, to the current church. And if the Lord should tarry another 10,000 years, it will apply to the church until he returns. The book of Revelation always applies to every people throughout history. That's what Paul means when he says, or John means when he says, I'm a partaker not only in tribulation, but also the kingdom. He's a partaker in the kingdom, and so are we. And we are in a very similar situation to John, aren't we? Right? We are in a position as the Christian church where we believe Jesus is the Lord, the King of kings, the Lord of lords and King of kings, like John will say in Revelation 17. We believe that. Jesus is on the throne. But we also live in a time where the church is increasingly being exiled to Patmos. The church is increasingly being pushed out of the political sphere, the social sphere, the cultural sphere, the entertainment sphere. We are being relegated to the corner of society. We live in a time that's remarkably similar to where John is, and you might feel that this Advent season, right? You're, we're, we're in a time of the year, which is the highlight of the year for you if you're a Christian. The highlight's not your birthday, it's not the Super Bowl, it's not New Year's, it's Advent, because this is when we celebrate Christ, and Christ means more to us than anything. And as we're going through this time of the year, that means the most to us, we're also spending more time with family and friends who may not think of Advent and think of Christmas the same way that we do. So we find ourselves in a position kind of like John, where we are devoted followers of Christ and bits to people who are not devoted followers of Christ, who think of Christmas as a time for family and gifts and presents and vacation and Christmas songs and jingle bells and Santa Claus, but not of Christ. And this, in our own small way, is our own tribulation, our own difficult time. So what tribulation has come upon you? Is it someone mocking your faith in unbelief? Is it someone doubting their own faith? Is it someone doubting their own salvation due to sin that keeps recurring in their life? Is it anxiously awaiting the opportunity to talk about Christ with unbelieving family this Christmas? We all have a John-like moment where we find ourselves on an island kind of pushed off to the corner in the midst of people who don't want anything to do with Christ, our own type of tribulation. But John would remind us that tribulation is also the kingdom. The kingdom is in your midst. The kingdom is among you. Whatever context we're in, as the church, like I said, we're all on Patmos. The beast of Revelation is alive and well, which we'll get to later on in the book. The beast is Satan. Satan, Peter says, is prowling around like a lion, seeking those whom he may 
devour. We see Satan at work clearly in our society. He's waging war against Christianity, against our doctrine, against our beliefs. We see that happening in our own denomination. There's a war against Christianity. He's at war with the church. He's pulling people away from the church. He's at war against children, killing them in the womb. And he's at war with the creation of man and woman, blurring the lines of distinction between male and female. Satan's at war with Christianity, the church, children, and the creation of man and woman. That's the beast of Revelation. We are in the apocalypse. He is prowling around. We are in the tribulation. And John says, if you are a Christian, John's your fellow partaker, not just of the tribulation, but also the kingdom. The kingdom. So how's that shake out, right? There's this tension there between those first two words, right? There's the tribulation and there's the kingdom. These things are at odds. These things are, are pulling against one another. There's this tension there. How can I be part of the kingdom if I'm also in this tribulation? How am I in the kingdom of God when I turn on the TV and somebody out there is trying to show my four-year-old that she can grow up and, or he can grow up and marry a boy and mutate, mutilate his genitalia? How am I in the kingdom of God when there's people out there trying to teach my four-year-old that? How is that possible? Well, it's the answer to that tension is in the third word. Tribulation, kingdom, and perseverance. That's the theme of the book of Revelation. We, th this book could be titled The Perseverance of John. Perseverance. That's why John writes. Not so you know how to predict the future. God is not all that interested in you knowing the future. He knows what it is, and he can handle it by himself. He's not super interested in you knowing the future. God wants you to persevere. That's why John wrote this book, so that the listeners of this text, which again, remembers for everybody, the whole church always, everywhere, the listeners of this text would persevere in the midst of tribulation. That's how we exist in the kingdom during times of tribulation, through perseverance. That's why Christ said, if you're worthy of me, you'll pick up your cross and follow me. Perseverance. In Acts chapter 14, Verses 21 and 22, it says, After they had proclaimed the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. And this is what they were saying. Through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. See, this is just New Testament 101, right? Jesus, he's like, hey, follow me. I'm on my way to die. In the book of Acts, Jesus sends his Holy Spirit in the second chapter. And then what do the disciples do? They say, hey, follow me. I'm on my way to die. And then after the apostles leave, the letters are sent out. that says, hey, persist, persevere. Like it says in the book of Revelation, persevere, hold fast, continue. Continue following Christ. We in America, we forgot that. We went through a really great season in the life of America where everybody seemed to be Christian. We had the Ten Commandments in our Capitol building. The kids were praying in school. Uh, it was illegal. Certain sins were against the law. We lived in this time where it was like, hey, man, you're persecuted if you're not a Christian, right? If you, back in the 1950s, if you said you're an atheist, good luck finding a job, right? It was easy to be a Christian in America from like 1776 to, you know, the year 2000, 2010 maybe. It was easy. Now in the scope of church history, that's a blip, right? In the scope of the 2,000 years since Christ, that 150 years, that's not much, right? What's the normal paradigm for Christianity since the beginning of the church up until today? It's hard to be a Christian because most people will look at you and scoff. And if they're not scoffing, they're persecuting. That's, that's the general consensus of the New Testament, is follow Christ and you'll suffer. And as we're reading the book of Revelation, we need to remember that that's what it's about. It's written for us. It's written to a, tr a church that lives in the midst of a dark and an evil age, where not just your friends and your peers are telling you to not follow Christ, 
but your leaders, your teachers, your politicians, your doctors, the scientists, all the people that society has put on a pedestal and says, listen to them. First and foremost, Hollywood, your entertainers, they're all saying, don't follow Christ. And in the midst of that dark and wicked generation, the book of Revelation comes and says, persevere. Continue to follow Christ in this dark time. Through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so John is experiencing his own affliction. He says in verse 9, he was on the island called Patmos. Uh, interestingly, John does not say uh, explicitly why he's on Patmos, right? He says, I'm on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the witness of Jesus. And so people kind of debate about what that means. What's it mean because of the word of God and the witness of Jesus? But it's, uh, it's essentially guaranteed that what he means is he's there because he was a witness of Jesus and because of that witness towards Jesus, he had been exiled. He lived during a time when the church was being persecuted, right? If you remember a few weeks ago, where I was reading you all of those historical documents, not from the Bible, but just ancient Greek historians talking about, this is how we persecute Christians. This is why we don't like Christians. The Christians refused to worship our local deities. They refused to worship the emperor. So this is how we deal with them. That was the context in which John's living. And so when he says he was on Patmos, it's It's essentially guaranteed he was uh, there because of his testimony, his witness of Jesus. And this island, Patmos, uh, it was about 50 miles away from Ephesus, right? So we're reading the book of Ephesians in the morning after Advent, and that was written to the church in Ephesus about 50 miles away. That was kind of a coastal town near the coast. 50 miles away is Patmos, and it was this um, group of islands And that group of islands was part of the uh, territory called Miletus. And Miletus was this uh, naval territory. So the the Romans had this little group of islands, and they would station their naval soldiers there, their ships there, and things like that. And when the governor or the emperor uh, had somebody that they didn't want in the Roman Empire, they would send them to Patmos. They would send them to this island that was controlled by the Roman Navy just to get rid of them so they wouldn't have to deal with them. I gave you that picture earlier of John huddled in some cave somewhere. That's kind of how we think of John on the Isle of Patmos. Actually, uh, Patmos was not a completely abandoned uh, rural island. Like I said, there was this naval encampment there. Uh, There's historical documents um, describing things like Uh, There was an inscription that archaeologists found from Patmos. They went to the island. They dug up this inscription etched into the stone. And the inscription was written to a hegemandros who lived uh, about 100 years before Christ. And it says uh, he was this honorable athlete. And there was this uh, gymnasium on Patmos where he would compete. Uh, There's other inscriptions to that effect. Uh, Bera was a priestess of Artemis. They found those inscriptions on Patmos, so they had the temples, cultic temples to Artemis, the pagan deity. Uh, so there was a lot going on on, at, on Patmos. Not like uh, in Rome, not like in Ephesus, not like in Jerusalem. It wasn't that crowded, but there was stuff going on there. You can think of it like a naval encampment. They had their own gymnasium and things like that. And we can be assured that everybody on that island, except for John, and maybe a handful of others, were antagonistic towards Christianity. So John, you know, he could have taken some solace when he was on the mainland that he was in a group of Christians. But now he's plucked up, and it's probably, he'd probably prefer to be in a place where there were no people, but instead he's put in this place where he's just surrounded by non-believers all alone, as far as we can tell. We don't have any evidence that John was there with any other Christians. And so that's John's persecution. Church history uh, says that John probably got off of Patmos at some point. There was probably some point where he was allowed to leave. Uh, Eusebius, Victorinius, Epiphanius, uh, these are church fathers, lived in like the 300s. They all wrote, hey, John got off the island at some point due to old age or the emperor saying his time is done, he can come back. 
whatever the case may be. So that's the picture of where John is. He's in this naval encampment. He's there around with all these pagan people, probably alone. And at some point, as far as we can tell, he was probably allowed to leave the island of Patmos. And so that's John's tribulation. That's what John was dealing with. How does that compare to where we are? Well, when I think about this, I imagine that we're like, we're not on Patmos, but we're also not back in the church in Ephesus, right? We're kind of on the, on the, on the ship in between, and we're not going towards Ephesus. That's how I think of Christians in our culture, right? We are slowly being exiled and pushed away towards Patmos, towards exile, towards being pushed off in the corner. In 1972, 90% of Americans said that they were Christians. 50 years later, they're about, in 2020, 64% of Americans said, claim to be Christians. So that's, a, that's about a 25% drop. That's more than a quarter. So we've lost a quarter to a third of people who claim to be Christians in this country in the past 50 years. That's a massive drop. That's a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, who used to say, I'm a Christian, who now say they're not. That's the ship going from Ephesus to Patmos, slowly being relegated, less and less influence, moved away further and further away from the spotlight. So as John's on Patmos, as we're on the way to Patmos, what's the biblical message to people in that situation? Well, it's in those two beautiful, simple words that follow tribulation and kingdom and perseverance. In Jesus. If you're looking at the LSB, you'll see that the words which are are in italics. That means those words are inserted. They're not in the Greek. They're inserted to make sense of the passage. But literally it just says, Tribulation and kingdom and perseverance in Jesus. These things, John says, are in Jesus. The, the tribulation, the kingdom, and the perseverance are in Jesus. What that means is that the 25% of Christians who have left in the past 50 years aren't actually Christians. It means that in the past 50 years, the church has not shrunk by one member. What that means is, in 1990, or in 1972, when 90% of people claimed to be Christians, they were getting something other than Christ out of their profession of faith. They said, yeah, I'm a Christian because it's helping me. And now, today, all the people that are no longer claiming to be Christian, they're not losing their salvation. They were never in Christ. The church has remained just as strong as it always was. Jesus says, all that the Father has given to me, I have lost not one. The church is just as strong as it always was. We aren't saved by praying some prayer. We aren't saved by having our name on some list somewhere. We aren't saved by going down and doing an altar call. We aren't saved by attending church. We aren't saved by being in right, and born in the right family. We aren't saved by reading our Bible every day. We aren't saved by any of these things, but we are saved only by being in Christ. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1, you'll see that Paul, at least 10 times in chapter 1, when he's describing our salvation, he says we're in Christ. In verse 1, Ephesians 1, 1, he says, The saints are faithful in Christ. In verse 3, he says, God has given us every spiritual blessings in Christ. In verse 4, he says, God the Father chose us in him. In verse 5, it says, We were predestined to adoption as sons through Jesus. In verse 6, it says, He graciously bestowed the glory of his grace to us in the Beloved. Verse 7, he starts his uh, sentence about our blessing with the words, in him. In verse 10, in him. In verse 11, in him. In verse 13, in him, twice. 
speaking of our sealing over and over and over again. As Paul is describing our salvation, he is repeatedly using the phrase, in Christ. And that image means a lot of things. But one of the things that it means is that we are identified. We, it's like my favorite song, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That's the picture, right? It's this rock of ages, and we are not outside the rock of ages, pointing to the rock of ages, saying, yeah, I believe in that, but rather, we're in the rock, in the rock of ages. And that rock is closing in front of us. The cleft is closed, and we can't get out even if we tried. Like John MacArthur says, if you could lose your salvation, you would. We are in the rock. And John here says that these things, this perseverance happens in Jesus. We are in Jesus. And so as we look at the church on the way to Patmos, as we look at these people who are jumping off the ship and swimming back to Ephesus, as we look at the culture which is getting increasingly hostile towards Christianity, we need to remember that the message that's given to us here in the book of Revelation is that we are in Jesus and we cannot be out of him. So John here again, he says he is this fellow partaker in tribulation and kingdom and perseverance, which is in Jesus. He says he's on the island called Patmos because of the word of God. And then he says because of the word of God and the witness of Jesus. So he's, he's saying on the one hand, yes, it's because of the witness of Jesus that I'm here. The witness of Jesus That's why I'm here. I witness to Jesus and I'm here. But he also says it's because of the word of God. So we need to remember that as we're in our cultural climate, right? John's saying, hey, the reason I'm on Patmos, because of the word of God. What does that mean? He's not saying because I have testified to the word of God. That's what he means by saying the witness of Jesus. He says, I witnessed to Jesus, so I got persecuted. It can't mean the same thing when he's saying the word of God. It's got to mean something different. What's the, because of the word of God mean? It, because, it, it means that God has decreed, God's sovereign word has said that I will be exiled to the island of Patmos. John is saying this is part of God's sovereign plan. That phrase, the word of God, occurs in scripture often to refer to God's plan. It says in Romans 9, 6, the word of God does not fail. When God says this is what's going to happen, it happens. 2 Peter 3, 5 says, by the word of God, the earth was formed. His word does what it, he says it'll do. In Revelation 17, 17, it says, these things need to happen until the words of God are finished. The word of God says, this is what's going to happen. And John says, I'm on the island because of the word of God. And so you and I are in the culture we're in because of the word of God. And so you see how Revelation, the way John's writing it, is an encouragement to people who are in the midst of a dark time. John's saying this is part of the plan of God. And so we have this tendency in the church to run around like chickens with their heads cut off, so concerned about who the next president's going to be or what terrible thing's going to come out of the White House or out of Hollywood, and and we think that we're going to lose the war and lose the battle, lose the cultural fight. But John reminds us we're here because of the plan of God. God knows what's going on. He knows the future. This is part of what, this is part of God's plan. And so John, as he's saying, hey, this is part of the, part of the plan of God, he, he concludes this, this pericope, this passage, this paragraph in verse 10 by saying, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. It was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And that's why I've titled this sermon, Laboring for the Lord's Day. Right? We, everything I just talked about, this persecution that's happening, this perseverance that needs to happen, all of that needs to be focused on for us as Christians the Lord's Day. We need to win back the Lord's Day for the church. We need to make sure that people who profess to be Christian are worshiping the Lord on the Lord's Day. Right? Why does the 
Holy Spirit, Spirit inspire John, why does Jesus appear to John on the Lord's day? Why is that? It could have picked any day of the week. That's significant. There's no mistakes in the Bible. Every single detail is there for a reason. Why is this happening to John on the Lord's day? The Lord's day, Sunday, is extremely important. Jesus himself, throughout the Gospels, repeatedly does things on the Lord's day. Jesus heals on the Sabbath, In Matthew 12, Mark 1, Luke 13, 14, John 5, 18, or 5 and 9. And those are all different healings. Those aren't the parallel passages. It's not the same healing. Those are all different times. If you looked at all the parallel passages, there'd be three times as many. Jesus performs exorcisms uh, on the Lord's day in Luke 4. He teaches on the Lord's day in Matthew 13 and Luke 4. Over and over and over again, Jesus is shown on the Lord's day doing these things. And then he appears to John on the Lord's day. Look with me at John chapter 20. In John 20, this describes the appearance of Christ. Look at 2019. This is the first uh, official Lord's Day, the first Sunday in John 19. While, John 20, verse 19. While it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, that Sunday, while the doors were shut and the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Okay, Jesus appears on the Lord's Day. Okay, now look at this. Look at verse 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the doors, having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Again, peace be with you. You know, eight days later. For a Jewish person, eight days later was Sunday, right? They counted the day that they were in. So eight days later, for a Jewish person, if you're on Sunday, eight days later is Sunday. We would say seven because we don't start counting till Monday, but a Jewish person counts the day that they're in. So if you're on Sunday, eight days later for a Jew, Sunday. So look at that. Jesus in John 20 appears on Sunday. He waits eight days until the next Lord day, Lord's Day to appear again. Then he appears to John on the Lord's Day. Uh, in Egypt, in the time of Ptolemy, the 25th day of each month was called the King's Day, or the Lord's Day. And that was because the Egyptians said that their king ascended the throne of his father on the 25th day of Dios. The same thing happened in Asia Minor. A day was named Sebaste, or the Emperor's Day. And uh, on one day of the month, in some parts, they would do the same thing on Thursday and say, this is our King's Day. And so what are the Christians doing? They're around Egypt and Asia Minor, and they're saying, no, no, that's not the Lord's Day, and that's not the Lord's Day. Sunday's the Lord's Day, the true Lord's Day. And we as Christians... If we're going to fight for anything, we need to fight for the Lord's day. We need to fight against the Egyptians and the pagans, and we need to say, no, this day is for the Lord. And we are in war over this day. This morning, as Olivia and I were driving to church, usually we're not driving to church, so this morning we're driving to church, and we passed by the park, and we see people, it's cold, 50 degrees for California, that's like below zero, right? I couldn't believe people were outside. We saw a whole group of people at the park bundled up playing volleyball, right? They got there at like 8 in the morning, right? You see all these people out on Sunday mornings. I'm always fascinated Sunday morning. Who's out? What's, what's going on on Sunday morning? See all these people out. I see all these things competing for your attention. Your kids start playing sports, and then they start playing on Sunday morning, Sunday evening, right? What, what is that? It's war for the Lord's Day. The society is encroaching upon the Lord's day. And they're saying, no, this is not the day for Jesus. This is the day for volleyball. No, this is not the day for Jesus. This is the day for football. No, this is not the day for Jesus. This is the day for doing laundry and sleeping in and sleeping off a hangover, right? What is that? Those are the the cultural kings invading in upon the Lord's day. But we see that it's very important to God, so important that he spoke to John on the Lord's day. And that's what we need to remember as we're in a time just like John. We need to hold on to the Lord's day. The whole day, not just the morning. Somebody's phone just had the ESPN ringtone. That's perfect timing. Love that. (laughs) Perfect illustration. So the Lord's day, right? We 
uh, why is the Lord's Day so important? I love Westminster Catechism, question 155. It says, how is the word of God made effectual to salvation? How is it made effectual to salvation? The spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word and effectual means of enlightening, convicting, convincing, and humbling sinners. What, what, see what it's saying? It's like, oh, great, read the word, that's good. But what's the Westminster Confession say? Especially the preaching of the word. It has a special effect on people. And this is what it does. It enlightens, it convinces, it humbles sinners. It drives them out of themselves, draws them unto Christ, conforms them to his Im- image, subdues them to his will, strengthens them against temptations and corruptions, build them, builds them up in grace, establishing their hearts in holiness, comforting them through faith and the salvation. This is all the things that happens through the preaching of God's word on the Lord's day. And so the point then this evening is be encouraged. I could have entitled this sermon Preaching to the Choir, right? Because we're all here on the second service on Sunday. We all care about the Lord's day because we're here, right? So I have the same message to you that John is giving to the churches. Persevere in your dedication to the Lord's day. Don't give this up. Don't give up. Sunday morning service and Sunday evening service for whatever else society is telling you that you need. Continue to persevere in maintaining the Lord's day for him because this is the day when Jesus meets with us in a special way. It's the day when Jesus met John telling him to persevere. It's the day when Jesus rose from the grave. He waited eight days later to appear again. It's the day when the Holy Spirit speaks through the lips of a sinful man to encourage us and enliven us. And there is a beast prowling around in the world today trying to rip the Lord's day out of your hands and to put something else in your lap. Resist that. Persevere in maintaining the Lord's day. Friends, we are not just at war with the culture. We're at war with our own church. There are people, many, many members of our denomination and the churches all around this city, members of the church who are increasingly moving away from the Lord's Day. They gave up the evening service, and then they gave up going every Sunday for every other Sunday, and then they give up every other Sunday for once a month, and then they give up once a month for Christmas and Easter, and then they give it up completely. That's where the war is to be fought and maintaining this day for the Lord. So I encourage you, and I am uh, uh, thankful to the Lord that he has so clearly worked in your hearts through the power of the Spirit to give you this same heart that John has for the Lord's Day. You have that desire. You have that longing for the Lord's Day. Hold on to it. Persevere. And not only that, but also thank God that he's given that to you. You're here because of the Word of God, because it's part of his plan. He's seen fit to bless you with faith through his sovereign grace and give you the desire to maintain the Lord's day and worship him. You're an instrument in the Redeemer's hand. What grace. How could we possibly look at the world around us and be discouraged when so evidently he's working in our lives, giving us the perseverance that John, the writer of Revelation, had on the island of Patmos. Praise the work of the Holy Spirit, that enlivening, empowering work that is present in our midst. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I thank you that I haven't been banished to be alone on an island, but I've been blessed to be in the glorious splendor of your church with brothers and sisters who worship your holy name and dedicate this day to your glory. Lord, we are so grateful to you. We are so grateful, Lord, that you have seen blessed, you have seen fit to bless us with perseverance. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage us this evening. Allow us this evening, Lord, to look into Revelation and see not only your holy word, but also see a mirror reflecting our image and showing us that by your grace and by your grace alone, we are described in this book. You have made us persevere, and you will continue to make us persevere into the end. We praise you for that, thank you for that, and we glorify you that for that in the name of Jesus Christ.